Today we have with us an eminent journalist from Bangladesh, Mr. Mahfuz Anam, who has been publishing, writing in the Daily Star, a most respected uh, daily in Bangladesh, who has seen a lot in his life and in his career as a journalist. He's agreed to speak to us about the events that have taken place and unfolded in Bangladesh in the last couple of months. Thank you so much for joining us. You're most welcome. <laughs> so uh, starting with the law and order situation in Bangladesh, how are things moving? We see that on the roads, law and order uh, is seemingly at least has returned. Uh, the police have called off their strike and joined back. But there was a gap, that one week in which the law and order completely went out of hand. D yes. yes. I mean, you know, when uh, uh, former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina resigned until uh, Professor Yunus came and took oath and became the formal you know, chief advisor, there was a gap. And uh, his return also was unfortunately delayed because of a, uh, you know, surgical procedure that he was undergoing in Paris. So I think people took advantage of that, and uh, most damagingly and hurtfully and regrettably, uh, you know, Hindus were attacked during that gap. Uh, but uh, I'm very happy to say that. I think that's stopped and then most of the law and order situation are back in normal. What we now are facing is, you know, I suppose uh, um, uh, um, uh, the, the very common phenomena where uh, when, a, when a powerful government falls, then you have all sorts of people saying, I was wrong, I was deprived, this and that. So now you redress my, 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 my grievances. And this is now prevalent in the bureaucracy in police in many many places so but also that is on the on the on the slide down okay so that actually brings me to the next question as to what are the key challenges that there are in front of the interim government it's been almost uh, more than a week uh, mm -hmm. that they have taken charge uh, we are seeing a lot of changes that are being planned in fact we also did a story on how police reforms are being planned because there was a demand uh, from the lower constabulary and the personnel that you know a lot needs to be right. changed mm -hmm. uh, because a lot happened in the last 15 years mm -hmm. so if you could tell us as to what are the ch challenges before the interim government, what all do they have to look at? <laughs> I think they have an enormous agenda in front of it. And uh, if they try to do everything, I think uh, they will not succeed. So the first task for them should be to prioritize. Okay, so one is to fix the economy, I think, and they're making good progress. Uh, on that count, um, the banking sector was in shambles. So that is one. Secondly, is uh, the reforms in politics, which is, see what had happened is, uh, we, we, what we call, we restored democracy in 1991 from Irshad's autocracy. So from 1991 to 2024, this 23 years, we have had unbroken, if you like, uh, uh, elected governments in power, which is a reasonably long time. Now, instead of building institutions of democracy, we have had a two-party rule, BNP and Awami League, one coming after the other, basically breaking down democratic institutions. Each time they came into power, they meddled with the bureaucracy, meddled with the banking system. In fact, even tried to meddle with the intelligence agency so that they can perpetuate themselves in power. Now, this happened, unfortunately, mostly under Sheikh Hasina's regime because she was in power continuously for 15 years. So now that there is a new opening, so everybody is saying we must do this, do that. There is a, a very strong sense that we should uh, amend the constitution in a way that so much power in the hands of the prime minister doesn't exist. She doesn't become, uh, you know, all... Uh, all center of power. So the, so the slogan is that we don't want any return of dictatorship right. in the future. So that is called for, uh, there is also call for, uh, you know, uh, judicial reforms because judiciary had also become very, very much impacted and politicized, by the way, in this regime. So uh, there's really a lot on the, on the, on the plate, but um, I just hope that 
they choose the proper priorities and move on. I trust Professor Yunus. I know him for a long time. I, I value his thinking, his contribution, his love for the people. He spent his whole life actually thinking and working for the lowest tier of our society. So I, I trust him. So when do we see an election in Bangladesh and how for how long will this interim arrangement go on? Now that is one of the things on the plate. Okay. Yes. Now simplest solution and which would be within the present constitution is to hold an election in 90 days. Right. But there is a huge resistance about it because we just don't want to go back to that Awami League BNP dichotomy. We have, we have seen BNP before and many of us remember it because I am old. But younger people who are, let's say, in their 20, 20s, mid-20s, they were 15 when, I mean, they were 15 when Hasina came to power, who are now 30s. And who are 25, they were 10 when Hasina came to power. So their whole knowledge of an administration of a government is Hasina government, which deprived them. Imagine a boy or a girl who became 18 in 2008 when she became, she got elected, have never had a chance to vote. She's, he or she is now 33. So that is a huge resentment there. But the feeling is that we can go back to our elected government structure after making sure that BNP doesn't follow suit on what Aumi League did. Right. So going back to uh, the events that in fact unfolded in the last two months, whatever happened, if you could tell us what was the tipping point really? 15 years of Army League was in power. Uh, we have been hearing about elections being rigged. There were several allegations of atrocities in students. So what was the tipping point and how did this turn into a, such, such a violent uh, protest that we saw Mujibur, uh, Mujibur Rahman's statues uh, was pulled down. And then there were horrific visuals uh, from across Bangladesh on how his house was burnt, that museum. How did it turn that violent? Well, you are talking about the reactions to the violent uh, violence. My focus would be on the violence itself, which, very simply put, was reckless police firing on demonstrators. Now, um, it started from the 15th. It started off with unleashing Awami League's student wing, which Hasina unfortunately turned into a group of hoodlums, you know, they were unleashed on the general students on the 15th. And I mean, with guns and machetes and, you know, big, big, uh, you know, instruments of killing, they went after the students. That is, that's how it started. Then the students re retaliated again. They didn't have any arms or anything. Then police came into the scene who started firing recklessly. Then we have a border guard uh, unit called BGB. Now they were brought onto the streets. I mean, these people are supposed to guard the border and they're trained to shoot, to kill. They are not trained to manage crowd. They were brought into the scene and then suddenly the, the death went up. You know, first day it was six, second day there was lull, third day 23, 4 day 40, 5th day 66. And now, mostly students? Mostly students and passerbys. You know, in our country, South Asia, there are a lot of vendors yeah. selling this and that, a lot of people walking about. So I would say, I mean, we had a very conservative estimate of 204, uh, out of which about 45 were students. Now, actually, later on, the figure rose to about 400. The UN ended up with a figure of 600, but of a slightly longer period. So, I mean, in South Asia, I, I, I don't think even in the British time, you have had within 10 days, police killing about 400 citizens. That to me was a tipping point. Okay. So, sir, so what led to that frustration, so much penting up of frustration? I mean, was it corruption uh, within the system, uh, you know, because we read reports and they talk about the corrupt system, how uh, only a few were, uh, uh, you Cronism. know, chronic capitalism. Yeah. So what was, what, what, what are the reasons that really led to this frustration? Uh, I mean, there is a whole set of reasons that accumulated frustration, mm -hmm. among which a very important one was their inability to vote. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, you know, in a democracy, we take a lot of rubbish in the hope that 
after five years, I'll have a day of reckoning where I'll be able to vote. Now, you should take that away from me. That's one. Secondly, total control of dissent. There was no, no uh, protests on the streets were allowed. Opposition was crushed. Civic society was not allowed to speak out. Any, even in seminars, if a, if a research organization came out with very dire statistics, they were termed uh, you know, as agents of, the, of foreign agents or something. Right. One instance, I'll tell you, that we have a, a, an institution called Transparency International Bangladesh, which is the Bangladesh chapter of an international body called Transparency International. They came out with absolute immaculate reports. But every time they would come out with the report, they would be termed as foreign agents or this is wrong or that is wrong. And interestingly, that tag TIB got even when BNP was in power. <laughs> so in the last 15 years, this this institution goes, always was termed as a fault. But they are among the few who were able to continue to bring out good statistics. There was another organization called uh, Center for Policy Dialogue. They did something, but either they were branded as uh, enemy voices or they were totally ignored. Mm. So you have no dissent on the street. You have total control of political opposition, you deprive people of voting rights, and you totally control the media. And I'm a testimony for that. Mm -hmm. I had 84 cases against me, mm -hmm. out of which 16 were for sedition. So that went on for a while, then they stopped bothering me, then they you know, would come back again. It would all depend on how good a boy I was in my writing and things like that. So I think the message here is that don't throttle dissent. Mm -hmm. G give them some avenue. And the most important avenue is election. Second important avenue is a robust parliament, you know, and third is media, allow people to do procession. And another thing that I think really went against Hasina and unfortunately is now maligning the image of Bangabundu is her building of a personality cult. Mm. I mean, Bengalis by nature do not like overbearing, you know, people and overbearing. Really. Hasina made her father. I mean, the the end of everything. I mean, liberation war uh, narrative started from her, uh, Sheikh Mujib's important role, ended up with his only role. You know, even uh, we had uh, Mujib's centenary in 2020. That continued 2020, 20, 20, 21, 22, 23, even till her fall, Mujib's uh, thing was continuing. But in that process, she over, over, over glorified Mujib. And there was, I think, internally a resentment. Secondly, we had uh, in, 19, uh, in 2021, 50 years of Bangladesh's liberation war. And I tell you, I as a freedom fighter was absolutely aghast to see how Mukti Jodhas were marginalized. It was again Sheikh Mujib who did everything. And some references to the, uh, um, the government in exile, you know, um, Tajuddin and something. And Mukti Jodhas like followed a tail end of a, a story. Mukti Jodhas were the heart and soul of it all. And of course they were inspired by Sheikh Mujib. That can easily be said, but I tell you, even Mukti Juddhas were marginalized. the The role of the um, you know the uh, the army armed forces who rebelled, like Zia Rahman, Khalid Musharraf, uh, uh, and many others, again they were marginalized. So she had such a control over narrative that I think she then became a victim of her own control of the narrative mm -hmm. and her view and her vision became absolutely narrowed to the extent that it became unrealistic. I mean, fair point, really. <laughs> but uh, why do you think that this sentiment of radical elements, uh, you know, mixing up in the crowd of students and doing all this violence, uh, how, why was it projected like that to the outside world? I mean, that's how a lot of media perceived it in India, at least. Well, not in India, at least. Only in India. 
and because india has so many media outlets and they have their own global linkages they just focused on the radical elements i mean you have been here for the last few days mm -hmm. how many radical elements have you seen mm -hmm. and at that time there there were even fewer still but in please in your country as in mine when a sudden change of power occurs all sorts of elements try to take advantage i mean it will happen in india too right. if there is a sudden fall of a government then you will have this mahashabha that mahashabha that group coming in and trying to stage claim and i think and this is a very pertinent point i'm making that india indian media is has almost started off almost like a self fulfilling prophecy this is very important you are saying all, all radical this is jama this is shibir so they are getting an exaggerated credit and that is also having an impact here the jamaat is themselves might be feeling that look here we did it because indian media is saying that i have heard so many of it that you know there's radical elements they're taking this and your depiction of isi in, involved pakistan involved i mean i said it in one of the interviews and i'm repeating with you that please give some credit to the people of bangladesh of being able to do something on their own without chinese or india or america or pakistan being involved they will take advantage there is no question and i'm too much of a veteran journalist to ignore that but that's not the mainstream and if you follow and support and strengthen the mainstream then these fringes will go out you are actually focusing more on the fringes so do you think that is the reason why common bangladeshis are angry with india because i have been like you said going around speaking to a lot of people and there is anger so why is it that you know people in bangladesh are most of them are so angry with india i mean you did make a point about uh, media uh, portrayal of uh you know of this revolution mm -hmm. but if you could elaborate a little on that well listen this is my perception from the recent coverage the impression i got was that indian media is only interested in hindu bangladeshis mm -hmm. they are not interested in us so your interest is not on the people of bangladesh but you are interested on a segment of people of bangladesh that i think is the main reason of the, f the the fueling of the anger i mean look at us as a people okay this is one secondly is that there is an accumulated you know uh, issue of water distribution first it was uh, ganga then now it is tista now tista story is something that you should investigate yourself i mean manmohan singh as a prime minister of india was visiting dhaka to sign the treaty and then suddenly mamta banerji threw a spanner but that is also like more than 15 years ago mm -hmm. so we don't look at india uh, in a in a fragmented manner we look at the central government and on the other hand of course uh, there are elements now as in india you have extreme elements who i mean your your uh, home minister uh, mr amit shah called bengali bangladeshis as termites i mean how do you expect us not to react such a humiliating terminology and he is in power he is not like anybody so i think we need to revisit our relationship i as a bangladeshi journalist and a freedom fighter and thinking of the welfare of bangladesh i am absolutely of no doubt that bangladesh india relationship must never derail itself it has to be on a friendly win win relationship but for us to reach there we need to understand india better yes but indian is to understand us better and because you are a bigger country you have more power more economy your responsibility of understanding us is that much more you know if you are three times the size of bangladesh or 10 times the size of bangladesh then your responsibility is 10 times to my responsibility this is not to suggest that i don't have a responsibility definitely i must now this for example the um, i mean so so we need to start seriously rebuilding our relationship you also think that what has irked bangladeshis is that hasina is staying in india and they are saying that you know india gave her shelter despite knowing what she has done back home and another point that they made was that despite uh, you know uh, elections being rigged in bangladesh in the last three terms uh, your country was the first one to congratulate her uh, on her victory we i think their indian focus was too hasina centric and outside her awamlik centric it was not people centric so 
that has to change and uh, it is also here i i resonate the same feeling that india was a true friend of hasina herself forget bangladesh they should have given her a more robust realistic assessment of the reaction to the elections she was holding in fact she almost became uh, she took it for granted that uh, um, india will help me whatever the election i do india is with me in fact there was a um, uh, article in the washington post that this time prior to election um, america was quite serious about pushing hasina for a more accountable election but at one stage india approached uh, america and said we'll 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 look at it don't push her too hard okay. and so america sort of stepped back this is a washington post story but anyway the impression is that uh, hasina uh, was so much a friend of india therefore uh, india turned a blind eye and quit pro quo because hasina helped in, i mean india stood by hasina so hasina must have given india a lot of things uh, that another government may not have given yeah. i am not going there that's right. not my story but right. my story is that the perception is that why was india so blind sided in supporting hasina if india really cared about its neighbor then they would have been more um, if you like realistic in their assessment and reporting to hasina so uh, talking about india bangladesh relations what do you think the damage is done but how do how do the two countries fix it what are the short term and long term uh, uh, things that the two countries need to focus on uh, to revive this tie i think to me the first thing is to understand who we are as a people now if you see a lot of people going to mosque and uh, uttering islamic uh, you know uh, islamic things and you think we are going fundamentalist is the first place we need to look at i mean i've said it before i'm repeating that if india can be proud of their hindu heritage and correctly so that is indian people's decision then you should also be let us proud about our heritage much i mean we have a collective heritage from buddhism hinduism and islam so when we talk about our islamic heritage why do you get so worked up mm-hmm. why do you come to the conclusion that this is jamaat inspired this is this they are a political party and they are waiting in the wings to take advantage of the situation but please place to start is to recognize our cultural heritage which is bengali and islam i am a very proud proud bengali i am a freedom fighter and i have my strong feelings against pakistan because they wanted to in a way um, eliminate us as bengalis but i am also a muslim i am <laughs> i mean the heritage that i have so i share that i don't think india appreciates that so this is the first thing they should do look at us as who we are secondly realistically help us grow because a a prosperous bangladesh is healthy for india for example when our per capita was below 500 we were a market of x amount now that that our uh, per capita income is almost 3000 then we are a bigger market so we prosper india can sell more goods to bangladesh okay and bangladesh can export more to india so economic issues should take very serious uh, consideration and india must think that okay how how can we work which really helps bangladesh grow because a growing a growing and a developed bangladesh is a bigger market for us i think that logic should very be very strongly entrenched in the indian mind and because you are a bigger country because you have so much more economic strength why not take a more you know more matured and serious and helpful view yes there was a quid pro quo that you do this and i do i have to do this the quid pro quo is a very simplistic you know approach but if we go back back to gujral doctrine and say okay we are going to help bangladesh regardless because the ultimate benefit will go to india a economically developed bangladesh a stable economy bangladesh a stable political entity bangladesh will all help india because india is a very important neighbor 
So I'm not putting all responsibility on India. Obviously, the responsibility has to be ours. A more mature, a more uh, well-versed, a more enlightened approach to our bilateral relationship. But India really should take a second look. So, so coming back to the interim government, I mean, what, what are the checks and balances you think are required so that it doesn't go back to what it was. In fact, in one of your pieces, uh, you wrote that Bangladesh is on a slippery slope. Yeah. So if you could elaborate that on. Well, it's if I may use uh, this simile or this, uh, that imagine yourself in, in front of a door that has opened up. That is the student revolution. The door has opened up and we, you see a lot of potential. We can do this, this, this better. But you are standing on a very slippery ground. You can slip, you can take a wrong step and the whole thing collapses. It is because, you know, uh, we are a very emotional people, okay? We are now full of uh, hatred for what Hasina did. And this may take us to another extreme position that everything that deals with Awami League has to be now negated and Awami League as a party has to be condemned. If we go in that direction, then there will be a resurgence. Just as Awami League's attitude towards BNP, that it was a party of all corrupt and anti-state elements, anti-liberation war elements, helped BNP to resurface. The resurgence in BNP is a rela directly related to the oppression. This is Bengali psyche. Bengalis are always on the uh, for the underdog. You know, it is their psyche. It is, you can blame us for it or or, or praise us for it. So underdog gets a sympathy. So if now Awami League becomes an underdog, they will get the sympathy and will always be in this Awami League BNP, Awami League BNP will and will never have a unified population. So very important that we 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 have a we have a you know a road towards a unified population. Mm. Which means that this government it is interim uh, they have a responsibility, but more important in my mind is the BNP mindset. Because at the moment when the election comes, whenever it comes, a year or two or even earlier, most likelihood is that BNP is the largest party to gain from this momentum. So if BNP comes back with the mindset that I'm going to teach Awami League a lesson, because Awami League did a lot of things against them, then we are back into this, you know, <clears throat> at this game, which has been quite destructive. So an interim government's responsibility is, number one, fix the economy. And again, now the flood has come, yeah. which is totally unexpected and right. very devastating. Right. So fix the, I mean, respond to the flood first, then fix the economy, fix the politics, and have the election as early as possible after the reform. So the sentiment now is reform first, election later. Yeah. But election can't be postponed if you like, uh, indefinitely. indefinitely. Right. People would want uh, a chance to vote back. Right. So mm, these are the slippery things I'm talking about. Right. You know? So what are the key departments in which immediate reforms are required? I think uh, Home Ministry, police reform is very important. Reform in the banking sector is very important. Reform in, uh, you know, like uh, holding election, proper election, the election commission, party uh, rules and And also I think there has to be a reform on election funding. What had become almost impossible is the figures that we hear that a potential MP spends to get re-elected. Now, if that is going to be the cost of your election, mm -hmm. then that MP will have to indulge in corruption to just raise the fund he has invested or he borrowed from others to invest. Mm. So ex election expenses have to be drastically brought down and that's where election reform becomes vital. Right. So, so talking about the Bangladesh politics, what is the road ahead? You've spoken about BNP. Uh, what about jamaat e islami How do you see the politics of Bangladesh shaping from here? Okay. Now, jamaat e islami is a very big question in the Indian mind. Right. Okay. Right. What are they going to do? I feel that democracy is the best solution to respond to extremism. Now, Bangladesh's history that uh, in many, many elections, Jamaat was banned immediately after our birth. Yes. Then it was allowed to function, I think, by Zia Rahman. And it functioned uh, till Hasina came to power and uh, then 
they were put under a lot of constraints. But when they did participate in election, their vote votes segment was four percent, five percent. Only once they got eight percent, where they participated as an ally of BNP. So even if you give it like a huge margin, they can't be more than 12, 13, 14 percent of the vote. It is best to see the people that they consciously vote in this pattern. Jamaat also will be there to participate. They can be in the parliament, make their own speeches. So in my view, democracy is the best way to handle extremism. You ban them, you push them underground, you have other reactions. Mm -hmm. This is one. Secondly is that uh, um, uh, there is a party called Jatiyo Party, which again uh, was a lackey of Awamili. So then that uh, that party also needs to say how better role they play. play. BNP will have to re rethink their old strategy, their party. My impression is that they need to reposition themselves on our liberation war because they wanted to sideline Mujib before. So they sidelined almost our own history, mm -hmm. you know, of mm -hmm. liberation. So that's something. Awamili really has to face an existential issue. They really need to reform. I mean, there, there may be some people saying ban Awami League and this and that. I'm not there at all. Awami League is a very, uh, I mean, is a 75-year-old party and it has made tremendous contribution. Before uh, Bangladesh, in the Pakistan days, for the birth of Bangladesh and after Bangladesh, at least Hasina did make some inf in interestingly important infrastructure. But corruption swept all other narratives under it. Mm -hmm. So Hasina now is a very, very reviled person in Bangladesh. Yeah. But Awami League will have to uh, uh, make an assessment, see where they went wrong. I think bring out some new faces in the leadership because most of their other ex uh, leadership are also discredited, like the party general secretary, many of their you know members uh, of the leadership. So they really need to come out with fresh faces. Only then our milli, I think, will be able to gradually earn the confidence. Mm -hmm. But if they stick to their own old politics, you know that we did nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't think public confidence will return very fast. And so what about the role of the army in this? Well, if you ask me, I would praise them very much because they are really the strength behind Yunus's. See, in my view, there are two. I mean, where is Yunus getting his strength from? He doesn't have a party. He doesn't have a... So he is totally supported by the students. Okay, so this is like the mass support. And institutional support is from the army. Army has expressed their full confidence in them. And pleasantly, and I'm happy about it, that army is really in the background. Right. They are not out there, right. you know, doing this and that. At the moment, they're out helping the, the flood, flood, victim, victim. flood yes. victims. But otherwise, the chief has been quite reset, uh, reticent, hasn't really come out. So I think army is uh, at least trying to show that they don't want to interfere in the let Yunus and his interim government perform as quickly as possible. And in fact, the army chief once said that when police is back and law and order is absolutely back, we would like to go back to our barracks. Mm. So these are signs, at least to me, which is very positive. So how was it like to be a, a journalist in in uh, during Hasina's time? I mean, you have seen uh, so many governments. How was it different? And how will it be different from here for journalists? Right. Daily Star was born in 1991 with the fall of Ed Shah. So from 1991, I would say that till about 2010, it was the golden period of Bangladeshi journalism. I mean, many papers came out. We wrote uh, really without any you know, restraint. Mm -hmm. And to me, those are the best years of my life uh, with the Daily Star. And then uh, from 2000, I think 11, 12, she started getting wary of criticism. And so <clears throat> first it was like demonizing the media in the parliament floor, particularly two papers, Protomalo and Mind Daily Star. And it went on for a while. The 
the the the the crucial uh, part was when hasina instituted the digital security act it is really one of the blackest of black laws imaginable uh, <clears throat> there were uh, mm, uh, 20 uh, mm, punishable uh, clauses out of which 14 were non bailable I mean, you are picking up a guy, a, a journalist, and, the, and, and, and it is non-available. So, approach was totally oppressive. So, I would say that from 2013 till her end, it was the dark period of media. And the biggest loser was she herself. It may be too early, but how do you see uh, the future of journalists from now? Uh, interim government, I see a smooth path, but when the elected government comes back, it's an open question because um, we have so far no governmental record of being tolerant to critical media. They love the lab dog. They hate the watchdog. <laughs> So, last question, what is expected of this uh, interim government? You have spoken about what needs to be done and what the challenges are. But what is expected of them to, say, uh, start work on with immediate effect? If you talk about expectation, sky is the limit. We expect democracy back, law and order back, rule of law back, fairness back, uh, human rights back. I mean, endless expectation. But realistically, I think... Professor Yunus will strengthen the democratic elements and also the representative process of getting an elected government, economy, uh, <clears throat> anti-corruption elements. These are the, if you like, the minimum expectations, which I think he will deliver. But the, I would not say that everybody is sanguine about how things are going. Mm -hmm. Questions are raising, and I wrote a piece uh, last Friday uh, raising some questions. So we are still on slippery ground. The the <laughs> questions, if you could elaborate that uh, on that a little. Please. What? What the, are the questions? No, the that question, are being raised. No, for example, the rec, uh, the random arrests of people. Now, <clears throat> our most famous cricketer mm -hmm. Shakib Al Hassan has been accused of murder because somebody put his name. So this is really creating the most, if you like, intense controversy at the moment, mm. that cases are being filed, people are being included in it, who do not uh, belong there. Now, <clears throat> a very famous leftist politician, Mr. Rashid Khan Menon, mm. is in jail today um, on charge of a murder. So I think what is really frightening now is that no relationship between what your crime is. So many people are now in jail who should be charged with money laundering. Mm. You know, absolute corruption, stealing public exchequer dry, but they're being charged for murder. Obviously, when you go to court, they're all going to get released. Mm. So why is this, if you like, um, recklessness mm. about arresting people? and then putting them under this or that child. This at the moment is really the question in people's mind. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. <laughs> so uh, that was Mr. Mahfouz uh, speaking with us about what lies ahead for Bangladesh, the situation right now, what is expected of the interim government. Uh, thank you so much for watching. This is Aranya Bhardwaj reporting for The Print from Dhaka.